dignitary students, and my dear friends. Good morning to all of you. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the International Center Goa for this lecture cup interactive session on disarmament and non proliferation policy of India by Ambassador Rakesh Sodha. This lecture is organized by us in association with the Department of Political Science and Center for Latin American Studies, Goa University. Uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce to you uh, Ambassador Rakesh Sood. He is the Special Envoy of the Prime Minister for Disarmament and non proliferation issues at the Prime Minister's office since September last year. He is a recognized expert in this field and the country's foreign policy on security, non proliferation and disarmament issues. He served in New Delhi for nine years as Joint Secretary, DISA, that is Disarmament and International Security Affairs, a division that he set up and headed from 1992 to 2000. In that, uh, in that post, he oversaw, oversaw the negotiations concerning the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, CTPT, and the Chemical Weapons Convention, and the deliberations on the Precise Materials Cutoff Treaty, FMCT. He also participated in bilateral dialogues on nuclear and other non proliferation questions with the world's major powers. He has served as India's ambassador to Afghanistan and Nepal, ambassador and permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. He has also served as deputy chief of mission in the Embassy of India in Washington, D.C. Among his other assignments abroad, Ambassador Su has been first secretary and counselor in India's High Commission in Islamabad and first secretary in the permanent mission of India to the United Nations office in Geneva, apart from serving in India's diplomatic missions in Brussels and Dakar. India has been advocating a universal ban on nuclear weapons. Until that happens, India has expressed desire now to be part of various nuclear and missile control regimes, even though they were set up passively against India by the US and Western countries after India's 1974 nuclear test. Ambassador Sood has already played a key role in explaining India's nuclear maturity in various chapters after the 1998 nuclear tests. While there is little movement in the official global disarmament agenda like it comes or CTPT. <coughs> India's nuclear and missile capability has come of age and Ambassador Sooth now plays a vital role to project and protect India's interests in the international forum, especially since India has been pushing hard to gain entry into non proliferation regimes like the Nuclear Suppliers Group. I'm sure Ambassador Sooth will throw more light on this. Please welcome him with a round of applause. Dr. Aparajita Gangopadhyay, the HOD of Center for Latin St American Studies, Goa University, who will chair today's session. Uh, we have our book with us, uh, Brigadier Harvijay Singh, Commander, 25, uh, Two Signal Training Center, and Station from Akamadan, Goa, and Rear Admiral P.S. Parhar, NM Flag Officer, Commanding Goa Naval Aviation. I welcome you all, and I hope you have a pleasant and vibrant information session. Thank you. The Honorable Governor of Goa, Sri Bharat Bhilibhanjuri, Director of the Goa International Centre, Ms. Nandini Sahai, the Chairperson, Professor Gangopathyay, Senior Officers, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's a great honour and a pleasure to be here uh, speaking to you about India's disarmament and non proliferation policy. I think that the starting point for I think that the starting point for an understanding of India's disarmament and non-proliferation policy is that it is sui generis, a unique position which is born out of our own historical experiences. Therefore, Western analysts often looking at the Indian position purely from the prism of the Cold War or uh, the US-Soviet context, sometimes pose questions about our stand and our nuclear doctrine, which are best understood by looking at factors that have guided our nuclear journey. There are three aspects here that I will take up in turn. The Indian worldview, the political will, and the development of the military technical capability. 
The first unique aspect is that India is a reluctant nuclear weapon state. We demonstrated our capability in 1974, but maintained nearly a quarter century of restraint before events both global and closer home obliged us to test in 1998 and declare ourselves a nuclear weapon state. The reason for this restraint was what I call the Indian worldview, which was formed partly by our independence struggle and partly by the ideology of the founding fathers of modern India, which found expression in our constitution. There was a strong conviction that India needed a stable and peaceful environment in order to address its development challenges. At the same time, there was a reluctance to be drawn into military blocks or alliances. A desire for maintaining strategic autonomy found its expression in our policy of non alignment. Secondly, there was and remains an abiding conviction that a nuclear weapon free world is a desirable objective because it enhances both India's globe and global security. And in fact, we are the only nuclear weapon state to maintain this time. Yet another unique aspect of India's weapon program is that it grew out of a civilian nuclear program and not the other way around, which is the case which is the case for all the other nuclear weapon states. In fact, the Atomic Energy Act, which set up the Atomic Energy Commission, was passed as far back as 1948. The first research reactor in Asia, which is Apsara, went critical in 1956. And the first nuclear power plant in India, which is also the first in Asia, went on stream in 1969, that's Tarapur. The reason was that our leaders were convinced that this was a technology that needed to be harnessed for the benefit of mankind. And as a result, India continued to take initiatives in the field of disarmament, beginning with calls for cessation of nuclear weapon testing in 1950s and following up with more comprehensive approaches in the 1960s. Let me just give you an idea as to how active we were in the field of disarmament during this period. India's first Prime Minister, Pandit Nehru, was a leading voice calling for an end to nuclear testing in the 50s and drawing attention to the effects of atomic radiation on people and the environment. In fact, he wrote letters to world leaders on this issue. Eventually, in 1963, the partial test ban treaty was concluded. What did it do? It banned testing in the atmosphere. But by this time, the technology for underground testing had already been perfected. The India-China War of 1962 and the subsequent nuclear test by China in 1964 introduced the nuclear issue into our security calculus for the first time. However, we continued to push for nuclear disarmament and in 1964 took the lead in calling for negotiations combining non-proliferation and elimination of nuclear weapons. This was the initiative that eventually took the shape of the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which created its own nuclear apartheid and fell far short of what we had visualized. Even as we saw the direction that the negotiations were taking, we tried to obtain security assurances from the nuclear weapon states, the US and USSR, and also UK at that time. But our efforts were unsuccessful. Eventually, therefore, we decided to stay out of the NPT, and thus was born the nuclear option, which was demonstrated as a capability in 1974. And after 1971, when we had already been subjected to nuclear coercion. 
Notwithstanding this, India continued to take additional initiatives. In 78, it called for a prohibition on the use of nuclear weapons. Subsequently, in 82, we called for a freeze on the production of nuclear weapons and related fissile materials. And in 1988, then Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi presented a phased approach for bringing about a nuclear weapon free world over the next 25 years. However, these initiatives did not receive the kind of response that we had desired. Meanwhile, in our neighborhood, the situation is also changing. Pakistan had developed its nuclear capability during the 1980s, and having experimented with subconventional warfare against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, sought to combine the two with regard to India. Pakistan's strategy now was to use extremist elements to foment insurgency, which could be passed off as a self-determination movement, with the assumption that a strong Indian military reaction could be deterred through nuclear blackmail, together with India's apprehension that the Jammu and Kashmir issue should not be internationalized. Even though the Cold War had ended, the optimism that it would lead to greater movement towards disarmament was soon dispelled. Proliferation emerged as a new threat. In 1995, the NPT, which had originally been negotiated for a 25-year period, was extended indefinitely and unconditionally, and any prospects of delegitimization of nuclear weapons receded. Negotiations on the long-delayed Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty yielded an outcome in 1996, but once again it fell short of our expectations. It was neither comprehensive because it permitted zero-yield testing, nor was it linked to a disarmament process, and therefore India decided to stay out of it, citing national security interests as the rationale. All these developments altered the nuclear security reality, culminating in the 1998 decision. Within two weeks after the Indian tests, Pakistan followed suit. But what Pakistan failed to realize was that the use of subconventional wars to change status quo would be seen now as both dangerous and reckless behavior. In fact, Pakistan's Karkil misadventure in 1999 was the first example of this changed global reality. 9-11 further brought about a sea change in the international community's perceptions about jihadi extremism and global terrorism. Following the 1998 nuclear tests, India declared itself a nuclear weapon state and put out in the public domain the elements of its nuclear doctrine. First, in the form of a draft by the National Security Advisory Board, and then in 2003, as the outcome of the review by the Cabinet Committee on Security. Let me just, uh, well, this is one of the last initiatives that he took on nuclear disarmament, and it's just a detail of the working paper that we had put forward. But let me move in terms of time to the Indian nuclear doctrine. You'll see the elements in greater detail. Let me just sum it up for you. Building and maintaining a credible minimum deterrent, a no first use policy along with non-use against non-nuclear weapon states, assured retaliatory capacity to inflict unacceptable damage on an adversary, commitment to non-proliferation reflected in a system of national export controls covering sensitive materials and dual-use goods and technologies, and finally, continued commitment to the goal of a nuclear weapon-free world. Now once again, these elements arise out of the Indian worldview and reflect both political will and capability. 
It is the same political will that had led us to reject the NPT in 1969 and the CTPT in 1996, even though initially these negotiations were based upon initiatives that we had originally supported. The political will was also evident in the fact that we had safeguarded our nuclear option even though displaying restraint. The third element that I refer to, which is necessary in any doctrine, is capability. And naturally, capability is not something static, but it has to be developed over a period of time. Resources are needed to build necessary strategic assets, which can sustain the no-first-use policy. We have improved our missile capabilities and made progress towards developing a submarine-based missile capability with a view to strengthening deterrence. A command and control infrastructure has been created, including a communication network which can survive a first strike. It is worth noting that most Western analysts looking at this region often talk about a stability-instability paradox. But this is invariably in the India-Pakistan context rather than in the India-China context. This reflects an inadequate appreciation of the complexity of our situation because it brushes aside the China-Pakistan cooperation factor. The second key issue here is Pakistan's doctrinal ambiguity, which still seeks to change status quo using subconventional methods. While attempting to find space for this, below the nuclear threshold. In fact, Pakistan's efforts to develop tactical nuclear weapons are often guided and explained by the old thinking of flexible response, which had guided NATO military thinking, except that both the circumstances and politics of NATO's extended deterrence were very different and no longer applied to Pakistani situation. The Cold War experience, and this is basically to highlight the differences that exist today as compared to the Cold War period. The Cold War experience was one between two superpowers who deterred each other at nuclear <coughs> levels. And conventional conflicts often took place between their proxies without direct participation of US and Soviet soldiers. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 had already shown that if US and Soviet soldiers did get involved, it could very quickly lead to escalation. This led the two countries to begin the bilateral arms control process. However, as both US and Soviet Union represented military blocs, they also developed war-fighting doctrines, leading to enormous expenditures and growth in their arsenals. At one point in time, there were as many as 80,000 or more nuclear weapons between the United States and the Soviet Union. This experience does not hold good for India because we have made it clear that we will not engage in an arms race but maintain a deterrent that is both credible and minimum. Secondly, the no first use policy shows that India does not consider nuclear weapons as war fighting weapons but as weapons of deterrence. Effective deterrence requires nuclear signaling, the use of coercive diplomacy, and a strategy of developing multiple options. This is why we have continued to pursue confidence-building measures with both Pakistan and China. I have focused so far on the nuclear policy because, well, this is just to give you an idea of the long gap and the um, situation, the restraint that India exercised. Israel has a blank because uh, Israel has never tested. and uh, But it is widely known to have a capability, a more than a capability. Uh, North Korea was the last country to have tested in 2006. As I was saying, I have focused more on nuclear policy because I think it is the area that attracts the maximum attention both at home and abroad. However, it's useful to remember that non-proliferation is a larger issue. And it is worthwhile spending a few minutes 
looking at India's overall approach to non-proliferation as it has evolved through the years. Today, there are five major multilateral non-proliferation related export control regimes. The first of these, the Zanger Committee, was set up in 1971 as per the terms of the NPT, which required that all countries exporting items on a trigger list must ensure that the recipient country will use these items only under IAEA's International Atomic Energy Agency's safeguard schemes. This was done in order to ensure that these items will be used only for peaceful purposes. After the Indian PNE in 1974, <coughs> there was a renewed concern about proliferation, and as a result, the Nuclear Suppliers Group was set up. It revised the Zanger list and has remained an informal but a very influential grouping. Post Cold War, proliferation threats were increasingly a source of growing concern. And in 1992, the Nuclear Suppliers Group added a second list consisting of dual-use items and technologies which would have application in the nuclear field. In the field of chemical and biological weapons, the Australia Group was established in 1985 in order to prevent supply of materials or equipments which could be used for chemical or biological weapons programs. The methodology was to harmonize export controls among member states and also have a certain amount of information sharing regarding proliferation risks. A third grouping, the Missile Technology Control Regime, was created in 1987 to prevent the proliferation of rocket and missile systems, particularly those capable of delivering weapons of mass destruction. These are defined as missiles with a minimum range of 300 kilometers, and capable of delivering a payload of 500 kilograms or more. Since then, these definitions have been expanded and unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, are also included in the list of sensitive items. While the above four regimes focused on weapons of mass destruction and their delivery systems, the Vasinar arrangement formally established in 1996 harmonized export controls among member states covering conventional arms and dual-use goods and technologies. Incidentally, the Vasinar arrangement is a successor to the Cold War era COCOM, which had been established to prevent export of weapons and technologies to then USSR and the Eastern Bloc. It is important to note here that all the regimes other than the Zanger Committee, which is linked to the NBT, are actually informal ad hoc regimes originating with a group of like-minded countries, primarily Western countries, that have gradually expanded their membership in a organized manner. As a non-aligned developing country with a strong commitment to expanding its domestic science and technology base, and here I'm referring to the 50s and 60s, and also a country which is not a member of the NBT, India was often a target of these export control regimes. I already mentioned that the setting up of the nuclear supplies group in 1975 was almost a direct reaction to India's PNE of 1974. While the Australia group came into being largely on account of use of chemical weapons in the Iran-Iraq war, the creation of the MDCR in 1987 happened just after, two years after India had announced its Integrated Guided Missile Development Program, the IGMDP, in 1985. There were also concerns about the China-Pakistan cooperation, which had started surfacing. Nevertheless, India's domestic policies were supportive of the concept of non-proliferation even as we objected to the discriminatory character of these ad hoc export control regimes. Secondly, most of our technologies in the nuclear and defense related areas were developed indigenously, unlike many other countries like Pakistan, 
China, North Korea, etc. Conscious of its responsibility, India was therefore able to use its existing legislation like the Explosive Substances Act of 1908, the Arms Act of 1959, the Atomic Energy Act of 1962, etc. to prevent exports of any sensitive materials or technologies. With the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the economic liberalization, the Indian private sector began to move into sensitive technology areas. Just as now, it also required access to technologies from abroad, which were often controlled through these regimes. Consequently, we began modifying our laws. We started with some dual-use chemicals, which were already being listed in the Chemical Weapons Convention. The Foreign Trade Development and Regulation Act was used to introduce a licensing system for special materials, equipments, and technologies, which was called the SMEC list in 1995, and subsequently developed after the Indian Parliament passed the Chemical Weapons Convention Act in 2000. The SMEC list now included chemicals and biological organisms, and is now known as the SCOMET, SCOMET list, which keeps going periodic reviews and additions. In 2005, India adopted a Weapons of Mass Destruction Act, reflecting growing concern about linkages between terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. And with this, what we did was we also introduced controls on transshipment, brokering, intangible controls over deemed exports, and so on. I have explained this at some length because it is yet another unique aspect of our policy and also relates closely to establishing India's role as a responsible nuclear weapon state. It has helped in gaining acceptance for India in legitimate international nuclear trade and commerce at a global level. As global proliferation concerns have gained greater prominence and within India, Access to sensitive technologies has become more widespread. We've modified our domestic policy by strengthening our own non-proliferation related export control regimes and externally are seeking membership on an equal terms with the NSG, the MTCR, the Australia Group and the Vasanar arrangement. Following our outreach activities over the last decade plus, the first breakthrough came when we obtained the NSG waiver in 2008 and the U.S.-India Bilateral Cooperation Agreement, which permits civilian nuclear cooperation and brought an end to the nuclear apartheid to which we had been subjected since 1974. We have also been active in addressing new nuclear threats in forums like the nuclear security summits. In some ways, India's non-proliferation record has been better than countries that have been members of these regimes. Every policy seeks to reconcile values with interests, and it also evolves over time based on changing ground reality. Accordingly, our policy articulation has reflected its own pragmatism, its own blend of a real and moral politique. If we look back with the historical perspective that I have tried to provide, I think we can find a degree of continuity in our disarmament and non-proliferation policies. India's evolution from a non-nuclear to a nuclear weapon state and Indian nuclear doctrine. The continuity is ensured by the same three factors with which I began, namely the Indian worldview, capability, and political will. And this is what makes our policy sui generis, which has served to safeguard India's national security interests by demonstrating responsible behavior, ensuring greater acceptance of India's position as a nuclear weapon state committed to non-proliferation conveying an appropriate message to potential adversaries, and finally, a message of reassurance to our own people. Thank you.
Thank you, Ambassador Rasool, uh, for a very comprehensive talk on disarmament and India's nuclear policy. Uh, before we open the floor for questions, I'd like to make some comments on his presentation. Uh, I was just thinking about the class that we usually teach on uh, India's uh, nuclear policy as part of India's foreign policy. And uh, where it is true that India's nuclear policy, or so called a plan for a nuclear option, began way back even before India became independent. And it was Nehru with his practical ideas as well as his idealist viewpoint that we see that uh, the nuclear program took forth. The success of the testing in 74, the 98, the Rajiv Gandhi peace plan, the unacceptable propositions of the NPT, the CTBT. All this is very, very true and very, very uh, uh, important for us. But what at times, uh, you know, really sort of tickles our minds as students of international relations and, and uh, those who study uh, foreign policy is the idea of disarmament. You know, when you talk about disarmament in class, it seems so vague and utopian at times. And in today's world, when there are, you know, the, the concept of traditional disarmament of between states, it's no longer viable because states are not really going to wars with each other. Rather, it is the non-state actors. And how do you talk about disarmament to them? It's something a little difficult to reconcile. Secondly, uh, even when we talk about con conventional, uh, you know, uh, nuclear proliferation, the traditional nuclear proliferation, we don't talk about, you know, there's very little in terms of uh, countries don't go to war uh, and deterrence in a sense has lost its value with the current scenario because the world is no longer about states and states interacting with each other. It, it is the, really the threat that emerges out of the non-state actors that make us re-look at, at uh, the use of nuclear deterrence, the concept of deterrence itself. Because today, I mean, uh, there are the non-conventional proliferation issues like fission material, loose, new, uh, loose nukes, which, are, which could be accessed by any kind of uh, terrorist groups anywhere in the world. What do we do then? How do we deal with such situations? Uh, so I think, I think I'll, 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 I'll sort of leave it at that. Maybe I mean, you, could, you could take from that, and as well as I'm sure there are like a million questions from the students who would like to ask something and others as well. Thank you. Uh, Probably we can begin with uh, three questions at a time and then we'll get a pass of suit to answer them and uh, go on to the next three. Is that okay? Ambassador Sood, uh, good morning. Let me join uh, Professor Dabopadhyay in actually extending that particular discussion. I think she's right when she says that the whole discussion on disarmament and non-proliferation has very subtly but discernibly moved away from conventional disarmament to the more dynamic issues of non-proliferation. And since the Nuclear Security Summit has been in place, which you mentioned, an important concern that has been taken on board is the whole issue of the loose nukes and fissile materials and how they are expanding. Now the Nuclear Threat Initiative has put out its 2014 Security Index. And I was reading the other day and it was really concerning because it places India at, at number 176 among the countries and it makes an observation that the finding is that our ability to safeguard fissile materials is worse in terms of a record than China and Pakistan. Now how true or untrue is this and how would you reflect on this whole kind of assessment. Because this was one of our one of our strong points where we said that even though there was a nuclear apartheid against us, we ensured that the safeguarding of our materials, our track record was quite good. And that was one of the reasons why in fact the world was willing to also give us the waiver. So how do you look at this whole assessment and the whole broader issue of the NDI? Thank you. You may not come back here again, so I thank you Ambassador Sud for a very, very uh, extensive uh, presentation. Uh, listening to you was almost like going back to our student days when uh, uh, our, our fellow students in JNU who were working in the disarmament study division would, would go to the MEN and then come back with memories of how well they were treated by you and and, and, and the tons of material that they would get uh, in terms of uh, uh, with the permission of the chair I would slightly broaden the discussion uh, from a larger foreign policy perspective. Uh, uh, as very rightly pointed out in your presentation, uh, 
when we talked about our nuclear posture, it was something which was quite unique, sui generis, the term that you used. Uh, our, our nuclear posture became symbolic of a certain autonomy of decision making that we stood for. Uh, however, when we extend that logic to our contemporary role in international affairs, and particularly when we look at our own neighborhood, and that's where I think your expertise on Nepal and Afghanistan also would bring in, and there may be some questions on that as well. Uh, are we a little hesitant in terms of asserting ourselves when it comes to, uh, say, say, our immediate neighborhood, where we would rather prefer to wait and watch and things to evolve? Uh, why can't we be proactive as we were at one point of time in, in the larger issues relating to disarmament? So, your views on that? Thank you. Well, it is true that in a globalized world, the nature of disarmament has changed. But yet, even in this globalized world, the legitimacy of use of force is still a concept that rests with sovereign states. So while non-state actors have the ability to exercise force more so today than perhaps they did during the 60s and 70s. Although if we start looking at the history of terrorism, you know, you had the Red Brigade phenomena in um, you, the first signs of terrorism began with Italy, moved into Germany, and you, we've had uh, events in the Middle East, the hijackings, you know, which used to be a major phenomena, major terrorist phenomena in the 70s and 80s, the air, airline hijackings. These kind of things did exist at that time. But yes, what has happened is that today, with the phenomenon of globalization of terrorism is something which is new. And in that sense, non-state actors have access to instruments of violence. But nonetheless, it is only states who can legitimately exercise force in their own societies. The difference is that today, with human rights and all other um, uh, shall I say, the realization that even states or governments do not have infinite legitimacy to exercise force and there are certain restrictions that need to be observed even in terms of that. And I think here, this is where the fine line has to be drawn. But it doesn't take away from the fact that ultimately it is states that have to negotiate disarmament treaties. Part of the problem has happened that the world, you know, uh, people might like to sort of be nostalgic about it, that it was a much more orderly world, the Cold War, you had the Western Bloc, you had the Eastern Bloc, and then you had uh, the group of non aligned countries which used to talk about the virtues of disarmament and so on. But even then, as I am trying to point out, we were always in a somewhat unique position. We were not a Brazil or Argentina. We were not a South Africa which accepted the NPT after apartheid was ended. We always had, because of our own worldview, a conviction about disarmament, a conviction about a world free of nuclear weapons, but it was also based on the realization that in a nuclear weapon free world we would be better off. That our security would be better off if the entire world was free of nuclear weapons. Because then the size, weight, etc., location and so on of India as a whole would be brought to bear in a global environment. But at the same time we also knew that this was not something that we were going to give up unilaterally. And which is where the references that I made to political will and development of technical and military capability comes in. So just as the idea of disarmament has changed somewhat, and perhaps in more recent years, 
we have not seen the traditional fora for disarmament negotiations as particularly active. By the traditional fora, I mean the UN in New York, the Disarmament Commission in New York, the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Uh, but disarmament negotiations have still taken place in the sense if you look at the uh, treaty on uh, landmines. Now it has taken place but it took place starting with a group of like-minded countries and then ended up being the Ottawa Convention. And the reason was that a large number of countries decided to ban landmines altogether. A small number of countries, and India is part of them, decided that we needed to have landmines and we were willing to go along with a more restricted use of landmines in the sense that we put in minimum metallic content so that landmines could be more, made more detectable so that after a time of hostilities landmines could be more easily removed and so on. So we were willing to accept these kind of restraints and this was incidentally done and legally agreed to. But this outcome was seen as insufficient by a number of NGOs, humanitarian groups, etc. And a large number of countries for whom life today moves in a post-conflict society. They don't have unsettled boundaries. And so therefore they wanted to move things forward and they took a different negotiating track and came up with what is today called the Ottawa Convention. So it is still disarmament except that with the diffusion of power you have, you see there is both a horizontal diffusion of power and a vertical diffusion of power today which used to be centralized in a state authority. So as you see this diffusion of power with multiple stakeholders emerging and you see this happening not just in the field of disarmament, you see it happening in the field of trade, you see it happening in the field of climate change and environment. So it is natural that new stakeholders come in and you start getting negotiations among multi-stakeholder, what I would call multi-stakeholder negotiations. But the states have to be an integral part of it because ultimately it is the state that joins up with any negotiated treaty, even the Ottawa Convention. It is the states who become parties to it. And therefore it is the states who then change their domestic legislation in order to implement the new obligations that they have undertaken. The NGOs become um, like a monitoring, you know, in, in addition to the international monitoring authorities that you may have, the NGO community could be the equivalent of a domestic monitoring authority to make sure that the state government, by state I mean the national government, uh, the national government actually observes the obligations that it has undertaken. So in that sense there is a difference, but in some ways the, the sort of the crucial responsibility remains that of the sovereign state. The nuclear threat initiative, yes I have seen that, but you know, uh, I think that this is uh, this has been a highly biased kind of uh, report that the NTI has come out with, because if you look at uh, if you look at the record, if you look at how uh, which you yourself referred to, the fact that uh, the NSG gave a waiver in 2008, the fact that uh, we have moved forward, you know, we came out with our doctrine way back in 1999, the draft doctrine and so on. The kind of transparency that we have uh, shown in, uh, in our nuclear posture post-1998 is a far cry from anything that Pakistan has shown. But perhaps in the recent years what has happened is that just as we have uh, focused more on the NSG and the India-US nuclear deal and so on, 
Perhaps we have not taken as many initiatives in the field of disarmament. Perhaps we have uh, not been uh, very active in communicating with things like the NTI. I mean, Joan Rolfing, the lady who runs NTI uh, for Sam Nam, used to be a young researcher, like an attaché or something in 1998 at the US Embassy when we had done the nuclear tests. And um, I think we need to improve on that. But uh, I mean, I don't take the NTI rankings that seriously. I really don't. Oh, this is the last, I mean, you, uh, that was a different issue. Maybe we can address it towards the end, the neighborhood in Afghanistan, Pakistan, because that's not, that, that, that would require a new lecture as well. Yes, uh, questions please. Uh, hello, sir. My name is Lawar Ahmad Zai, uh, and I'm from Afghanistan. I'm studying in political science department. Sir, actually, I have three questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, you have been ambassador to Afghanistan, sir. Uh, what is your opinion about the bilateral security agreement between Afghanistan and India? Uh, and my second question is, uh, in today, almost all the world is concerned about the nuclear weapon of Pakistan that uh, it may fall in the hands of uh, radicalist and terrorist groups. Uh, what would be the important measures to be taken? And my uh, third question is, uh, so as uh, yesterday, the U.S. reduced uh, the non-military uh, aid to Afghanistan for almost the half. Uh, so how the world can expect Afghanistan to fight the terrorists uh, in a broader perspective? Because one of the main objectives is uh, that there is unemployment. This is why people are joining them. Okay, let me start with Afghanistan. Yes, I spent three years uh, as the Indian ambassador to Afghanistan. Uh, I count that as uh, one of my most rewarding assignments and one of my most uh, satisfying experiences. As you know, President Karzai has been Frequently, in fact, in 2013, he was in Delhi in December and earlier in the middle of the year as well. The bilateral security agreement that is currently the subject of discussions between the United States and Afghanistan is something which is for the two countries to decide upon. President Karzai has raised certain concerns uh, with regard to some of the conditionalities that he has put in. I think he has briefed us, when he came to India, he has briefed our leadership about the reasons why he has these concerns. And I think uh, these are genuine concerns. I think it is important that uh, these concerns be addressed, and I'm confident that uh, the U.S. will find it possible to address these concerns so that the bilateral security agreement can be signed and put into place. Regarding Pakistan's nuclear weapons, well, your question is completely opposite to the point that was earlier being made regarding the rankings of the Nuclear Threat Initiative report. But yes, given the fact that today, uh, the number of terrorist attacks in Pakistan has grown rapidly in the last three to four years. There is not a single day that you do not hear of at least one terrorist-related attack in Pakistan. More worrying is the fact that defense establishments have been successfully targeted in Pakistan. And even though the nuclear establishment has escaped any such attack, I'm 100% certain that for the Pakistani establishment, this is a source of major concern, as it is for countries around. In the reference to the Yavayani episode, it is said that uh, India needs USA, but USA does not, does not need India. Is it so? No. I did not say that India needs USA and USA does not need it. But is, is it really about some persons in newspaper. No, no, I don't think so. I think that uh, it is the India-US relationship is a relationship which is only possible if it is 
to mutual benefit. And I think um, the best example of that was when President Obama said that this is the indispensable alliance of the 21st century. Indispensable alliance of the 21st century, which meant that we are looking at this as a bilateral relationship, which not only is to each other's mutual benefit, but for wider regional and global stability. And uh, that kind of a comment is not, or that kind of uh, declaration is not made easily. So I don't think that uh, it's a one-sided relationship. Can I just, uh, thank you. Well, um, I think uh, we know that the whole episode with atmospheric testing I refer to that, and that's why I mentioned that Pandit Nehru was among the Indian, first Indian Prime Minister. In fact, uh, he was among the people who took a very active role in calling for a complete cessation of nuclear testing. And uh, he spoke about the effects of radiation on human life, on environment, and so on. And uh, that's how. That is one of the initiatives, but then at that time it did not lead to a full, full scale ban on testing, but what it did was it just stopped testing in the atmosphere. But as I also mentioned by that time, the technology for underground testing had been perfected. So what it did was it drove testing underground. And uh, then it is much later that we come to a situation where all testing comes to an end. Well, before Dr. Karnapadhyay gives a formal vote of thanks, I would like to formally thank you very much, Dr. Sud, for taking time off from your very busy schedule. And uh, this is a simple request, and you came. Thank you very much. It was a very, very informative and educative lecture. Uh, may I request? Honorable Governor to kindly give him a little token of appreciation from our side. And maybe if you'd like to say a few words. <laughs> Thank you everybody for having uh, come here and heard Ambassador Sood. I am sure that you are thrilled as I was listening to him. And uh, I mean, there is no denying the fact that despite our apprehension, despite our, our uh, uh, sort of questions and queries, uh, India has been successful in terms of its nuclear program. It has been both for in terms of energy as well as for in terms of security. And I'm sure that, like me, all of us uh, here will go back, you know, uh, thought-provoked and we'll be, we'll, we will in, uh, retrospect about what we heard today here. Thank you, Madam from France, but I'm putting too much of pressure on all of us to think when we, the future lies on our shoulders. Uh, but nevertheless, thank you, Ambassador Sood from, uh, from the International Center, as uh, Mrs. Sahai has said, and also from the University, from the Center for Latin American Studies, and from political science students, all of us who are here, and uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to have heard you. Thank you so much. <laughs>